Hi everyone, um, thanks for connecting. Uh, welcome to another webinar on unified thinking on COVID-19. Uh, the purpose is to integrate our thinking on COVID-19 as it continues to disrupt and end lives around the world. Uh, the impact of the novel, novel coronavirus is complex and multi-dimensional, as you know. We'll discuss key components of our conceptual framework and also consider what the world may look like after COVID-19. As always, it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Zubin Olsen. Uh, uh, Professor Austin, thanks so much for connecting. My pleasure. Um, Professor Austin is currently Professor and Koffler Chair at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy and the Institute for Health Policy Management and Evaluation, Faculty of Medicine at University of Toronto. His research focuses uh, on the professional and um, personal development of healthcare workforce. He has published over 200 peer-reviewed uh, manuscripts and authored five reference texts. In 2017, Professor Austin was recognized in recognition of his societal impact of his research. Um, he was awarded a fellowship with the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, the highest award for health researchers in Canada. He is also the only University of Toronto professor ever to have received both the President's Teaching Award for Sustained Excellence in Education and the President's Research Impact Award for the global importance of his work. Um, he has been named Professor of the Year by students on 20 separate occasions. Um, by means of, a, of an update to bring the, the listeners up to speed where we're at at the, the moment with the, the spread of the novel, uh, novel coronavirus, um, in total, there are 3.5 million confirmed cases around the world, uh, with the, the U.S. leading that number at approximately 1.1 million, followed um, in Europe by Spain of just shy of 220,000, in Italy 210,000. Um, and total uh, confirmed um, deaths 248,000, um, and that total mortality being led by, by Italy um, in, uh, in Europe. <clears throat> so the, the purpose for the, the conf um, conversation today is to explore in a little greater detail the, the impact on education, higher education and the, the profession of uh, pharmacy. Um, Professor Austin, the, um, I want to ask you, uh, given the rollout of coronavirus, um, how, do you, how do you anticipate it impacting uh, the practice of pharmacy? I actually wonder whether or not after this is all done, we're actually going to have some singular entity called the practice of pharmacy. Mm. What uh, history has taught us over many, many uh, centuries, of course, is that following a crisis, there are many opportunities, but there are many challenges. But one of the things that definitely is likely, they're definitely going to occur, is this notion that old rules do not apply. A highly regulated, proceduralized profession like pharmacy that has historically benefited from structure predictability and governance is going to have a difficult time, I fear, adapting to whatever comes post COVID. Mm. And as a result, talking about the practice of pharmacy as though it were a single thing, as though it were something that could be described and encapsulate a broad variety of different ways of practicing. I'm not sure that's going to hold true in the months and years ahead. Mm -hmm. Instead, I think the question is going to be what different kinds of practices of pharmacy are we going to see? And the proliferation of different approaches to professional practice that we saw prior to COVID is simply going to accelerate. Got it, got it. Because we, we're kind of accustomed to, to thinking of the, the practice of pharmacy in these is in these broad terms, right? So community pharmacy, clinical and hospital pharmacy, industrial pharmacy. Um, um, uh, given what you, you said is, uh, do you think that would be a further kind of decentralization or further specialization within those um, broad categories? Yep, uh, you may use the word specialization or decentralization. I actually use the word fragmentation. Okay. What I actually see happening in the, uh, in the years ahead is that we are going to see what used to be industrial pharmacy perhaps look a lot more like community pharmacy. Hospital pharmacies will start to assume certain industrial qualities to them. There's going to be a mix and match, choose your own adventure type yeah. of uh, approach, I think, to professional practice. One in which individual practitioners are going to need to be more entrepreneurial, more flexible, more respectful of what it is that their clients need and want from them and more willing to innovate, potentially take risks and potentially sink or swim 
based on their own skills and competencies. Got it. Got it. So, um, so um, I'm just kind of thinking ahead into the into the future. And given what you you said, would well, would this mean that the, the smaller pharmacies are potentially no longer going to be there? Um, in yep. Great question. I don't think the size of the operation matters as much in the future as what goes on in the operation. A small pharmacy that has low overhead um, may be more nimble, may be more able to respond quickly and effectively to local evolving needs. So scale is not, I think, the issue here. Yeah. I actually suspect it's going to be entrepreneurial vision nimbleness adaptability of the individual or individuals within the pharmacy mm. that's going to be a much more powerful predictor of future success that's the that's interesting i'm, I'm just wondering to to what extent um schools of pharmacy in general have equipped current pharmacists or or um, to be able to cope with the the, the significant change um, because each of the the points that you you mentioned suggest a very strong entrepreneurial creativity a flexible individual um you know is is our training really geared for <laughs> to to produce those those individuals um this could be either a very short answer or a very long answer <laughs> um the reality is no historically okay. uh, you know none of us have ever experienced a seismic shift as significant as COVID. Yeah. And as a result, while over the last 10, 20, 30 years, there certainly has been some attempt to instill certain kinds of propensities in students related to entrepreneurship, leadership, adaptability, innovation. This has never been the core of the pharmacy curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, this has always been a nice to have add on. It's something that may have appealed to some students. But the reality is historically and traditionally, the kind of student that wanted to go into pharmacy in the first place tended to be the kind of student who was very comfortable working within large systems, following rules, adhering to guidance. Most yeah. people who select pharmacy as a career typically are going to appreciate an environment that is proceduralized, standardized, and organized. And none of that applies today. Wow. So beyond what a school can take responsibility for mm -hmm. in terms of helping people to prepare for what comes next, each of us as individuals are also going to need to take some personal overship over some fairly yeah. significant personal and psychological development we're going to need to do. I, I can imagine. I'm, I recall many years ago reading an article where, when I was a pharmacy student. Now, now that's many years ago. I, I can say that now. <laughs> Not as many years ago as me, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, exactly. And, and it was, uh, uh, its title was the McDonaldization of, of pharmacy um, in, in the sense that the, the work of a pharmacist would be highly routinized. Um, and it was anchored very specifically in the, the American, uh, the changes that were taking place in the American pharmacy practice landscape. Um, so this was um, maybe uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. That, that article kind of come to, to mind. And I was just wondering whether you, um, this suggests that this would kind of accelerate that um, routinization of pharmacy practice. Um, yeah. Um, it's and again I'll go back to it I'm not sure that we can talk about pharmacy practice as a single unitary right. thing okay. I think one branch yeah. of pharmacy is actually going to become even more standardized and routinized okay. and that branch in particular is going to be highly susceptible to automatization okay. um, and I don't know if actually we're going to see a lot of pharmacists directly involved in that. So for example, you could see one branch of the field is going to be concerned with um, supply chain issues, drug distribution, procurement, um, pre-package, all of those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing in the context of COVID is a need to accelerate automatization of that field and even more standardization and uh, as a way of making sure it's a secure distribution channel. Yeah. Do you need pharmacists involved in that? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you only need one pharmacist overseeing a whole fleet of regulated pharmacy technicians, um, robots, sensors, uh, barcodes, etc. Where I think there's going to be some interesting shifts is what happens to the patient-facing side yeah. of the field. 
One of the enormous opportunities that has opened up in many countries in light of the recent COVID experience has been the recognition that pharmacists and pharmacies are uniquely well positioned to be primary care delivery centers. Okay. In a world where doctor's offices may be inaccessible, where physicians are only available through Zoom links or yep. <laughs> other virtual conversations, people still have a need to see healthcare professionals, yeah. still feel a need to be seen by healthcare professionals. Mm -hmm. And in many countries, the community pharmacy, the local drugstore has become the only accessible primary care place where any kind of face-to-face non-virtual contact is possible. I do think that in many places what you've seen are a lot of pharmacists stepping up to the plate and yeah. providing a level of service and care that might be surprising yeah. to many. Yeah. And I think the recognition by the public, by governments, by other healthcare professionals that, wow, who were these people that we mm. never really thought about? Mm. Maybe we need to bring them more tightly into primary care, find roles for them and make them part of yeah. a more embedded network of practitioners. Got it, got it. So, so uh, social distancing is a major tool that epidemiologists use to, to kind of prevent the, the, the spread of, of any virus. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it seems that um, uh, from what you were saying, automation, uh, robot sensors um, helps to address that concern on utilizing social distancing within the pharmacy uh, model um, to reduce the risk of transmission, I guess, uh, from pharmacist to pharmacist or pharmacist technician to pharmacist and, and vice versa. But, um, but at the, at the coal face where the primary care, uh, where the pharmacy is accessible as a kind of the first port of call for primary care, um, th that, that model would not significantly change, um, would it? Because it always kind of depends on that physical face-to-face -face in interaction. Yep. I, I suspect that you might start to see some changes actually. Okay. Right now what we have is a very general practice model of pharmacy, drug distribution, and clinical service all embedded in one relatively small retail footprint. So people come and they pick up prescription medications, over-the-counter medications, receive clinical care, consultation services, and it's all happening in one space. Yeah. And that's part of the issue. If we were to see, and I, we may actually see in as, as things evolve, the decoupling or disaggregating of all of these different activities, which might make sense as a profit center or, or as a business model, yeah. as we disaggregate this to ensure that we have appropriate social distancing, that we take full advantage of uh -huh. technology, you might not see that. Let me give you an example of what I mean. In many parts of the world, there are grand experiments going on right now focused on central fill models, hmm. particularly for refill prescriptions. Okay. Um, we're seeing a transition that has been happening in places like the United Kingdom and Canada, for example, yeah. where instead of going back to your community pharmacy, your local drugstore to get a refill on a prescription, that entire process is automated, roboticized, and done in some large suburban campus, and the refill prescription is simply posted to you. Okay. We don't quite have this the mechanics of this all worked out right now, but if we were to do something relatively straightforward, like uh, ensure central fill yeah. was completely done in an automated, distributed way, so it enhances social distancing, the business model of community pharmacy in most countries would collapse. Okay. And so we're going to start to see disaggregation of certain activities. And what that means is that pharmacies need to start to do other things simply then rely upon mm -hmm. refill prescriptions as the major vector for revenue generation. Got it. So, so these are other complementary services that could be potentially added to, to what pharmacies are currently offering? Exactly, and it's going to need to be broadened, I suspect, as well. Um, something uh, that you've also written a lot about um, uh, pre-COVID-19 was this um, uh, professional identity of, of pharmacists and identifying the extent to, to which is congruency in the expected role of a pharmacist compared to his or her perception of and, and trying to match those. Um, and what, uh, what you identified in a lot of your, your publications is that there's, in some cases, some dis, uh, disconnect or um, 
um, you know, a misalignment between the two. Do you think um, COVID-19 is going to realign um, or or further exacerbate <laughs> this incongruency um, yep. or this dissonance? Well, in the grand tradition of social sciences research, Rao, I would say for some people it will, for some people it won't. <laughs> The reality is for some pharmacists, the current time has been incredibly traumatizing. Yeah. Some pharmacists are being asked to do things they never imagined, they have no confidence in their ability to do, yeah. and they just honestly don't believe a pharmacist should be doing this. Mm. How am I supposed to be able to assess whether a person's asthma control is good? How am I supposed to be the one who is supposed to be um, modifying insulin doses for a patient yep. um, because they're asking me, I don't know how to do this. And if I do know how to do this, I only know how to do it as an academic case study, not with a real patient sitting in front of me. Yep. There's a considerable number of pharmacists that simply do not have a self-identity that is congruent with the notion of an independent decision maker. Okay. There are a significant number of pharmacists who do have that self-identity. What we are seeing now is, I would say, and we're seeing it not just in pharmacy, we're seeing it in society as a whole, this splintering or fragmenting of what used to be a relatively homogenous group of individuals who had a relatively shared view of what they do, what's expected of them, and what their role is. Mm -hmm. COVID is literally busting this wide open. Yep. There are going to be enormous opportunities for some and enormous losses for others. And the question we all have to ask ourselves, those of us who are pharmacists, mm. is which side are we going to be on yeah. in a world where you have to choose a side? Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. Um, um, the, do you anticipate that pharmacy technicians would also undergo the, the same transition, kind of this bursting of the, the bubble and realignment? Because they're, they're a relatively newer group of, of support staff added to, to pharmacies. Um, yep. So, you know, pre-COVID-19, they were already in transition, and now now there's something else <laughs> added Yep, to. absolutely, yep. And they're, 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 again, a really fascinating group to observe because they're a relatively new profession, yep. and they are actually in the, in the process of defining and developing a unique professional identity. I would suspect for many pharmacy technicians, there are significant opportunities and significant risks. On the risk side, of course, is the risk of automation. Yeah. The idea that the best form of social distancing is the form of social distancing where human beings aren't involved At and all. don't touch wow. products in, in any way. And certainly while the technology is there, there hasn't been an economy of scale to allow it to flourish. But for example, if you move to regional central fill facilities, yeah. The number of pharmacy technicians required to manage a bank of automated dispensing systems is far fewer mm. than the number of pharmacy technicians required to actually manually fill in local drugstores. So there are some risks. The upside, of course, is there's incredible opportunities for pharmacy technicians to specialize, yeah. to become more focused on, for example, technology, to become experts mm. in uh, supply chain management, logistics, uh, sterile products preparation, ensuring the integrity of pharmaceutical products. So it's going to require creativity, some risk, some entrepreneurship for pharmacy technicians as well to identify what's their job going to be going forward. So the, so the, the central full model that you, you're describing and where pharmacy technicians would fit in would essentially be one, um, is it correct to, in my interpretation, one single hub? Yes. Um, and then from that hub is many access points um, connected to to that hub where, where simply it is a, pharmacy, a pharmacist or pharmacy technician taking the, the, the medicine, providing it to the patient, but then obviously with the value added service. So, so pharmacy would physically look very different in the, the future. Absolutely. The footprint of pharmacy, the products in a pharmacy, and the actual things that people come to that shop for. Yeah could significantly change. And the key is to also recognize that in such an environment, not only are we going to be responding to consumer-led demand, yep. we actually have an opportunity to lead patient expectations, to provide, experiment with yep. different forms of services, and start to build 
markets and build interest in all of these rather than simply paying cat, catch up to what consumers are wanting. Got it. That's the kind of entrepreneurship, the kind of leadership, the kind of innovation that the field as a whole needs to get its head around. And certainly individuals within pharmacy will find a way of making that work. But for those who are simply sitting around waiting to be told what yeah. to do, they're the ones that are perhaps at highest risk. There's um, in, in your publications, you, you mentioned that the um, reshaping professional identity um, happens uh, more rapidly under high stress. Um, and there was a specific phrase that, that I'd like to quote you is community pharmacists have incomplete, separated or functional rather than existential professional identities. Um, or, although that, that was a critical finding in, in your paper, um, on, on the flip side, there's fantastic opportunities um, for fulfilling the societal needs um, and to address this particular challenge of, you know, reshaping the professional identity. Absolutely. One of the things that makes this time so difficult for so many people is simultaneously seeing it as a time of threat yeah. and a time of great opportunity. Mm -hmm not either or, not for us as a society, not for us as a profession, and not for us as individuals. Learning to successfully negotiate the ambiguity that we simultaneously mm. are going to experience both gain and loss, and being comfortable in figuring out how we can maximize or optimize gain and minimize loss, is that's a crucial life skill everybody's going to need to develop. And it applies very much to how we define who we are as a profession, uh, what our identity really is. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it comes back to the, the point that you mentioned a little earlier, which is independent decision maker, that we, we really mm -hmm. do need to, to cultivate that. Jumping onto, onto a slightly different track um, um, is higher education and schools of pharmacy. Um, do you anticipate COVID-19 um, disrupting the higher education model in pharmacy uh, in the, the future? Yep. Um, massively. Uh -huh. Pharmacy exists in most countries as a subset of broader higher education. Um, as of the date of our conversation, uh, we don't really know what the next few weeks, months, certainly not even the next year looks like. Uh, higher education has traditionally been a face-to-face -face endeavor. Yep. Um, I'm not sure that's going to be the case in the years ahead. We could very easily see much of pharmacy education migrate to online uh, mm. kinds of systems. Online teaching, testing, assessment is certainly the technologies out there. We're just very late okay. to, to this game. <laughs> what are the consequences of an online educational model with respect to professional socialization, mm. development of professionalization, development of, uh, of mentoring networks, and developing of some kind of a unified professional ethos. We don't know. What does online education look like? For example, in the United States, there's more than 150 different pharmacy schools scattered across the entire country. In the United yep. Kingdom, there's you know a large number, Australia. Canada, fortunately, we haven't had that proliferation of schools, but do you actually need that many schools, that many professors, that many instructors? If education is offered online, yep. we have lots of experience in other fields of something called MOOCs, Massive okay. Open Online Courses. Yeah. Do we actually need pharmacy education to be face-to-face? -face? What happens with clinical education? and the apprenticeship that is part of, for example, pre-registration training or internships. We have no idea right now how this is going to evolve, um, but it will evolve very rapidly in the next few months and years. Yeah, yeah. Um, it seems a, a such a critical decision point because we, we still don't know a lot about uh, COVID-19, the novel mm -hmm. coronavirus, um, mutations, um, strains, um, other variants in the in the future. And um, we also don't know if there's going to be an, another lockdown. Um, for instance, if, you know, October, November, December rolls around, then do we all have to go and lock down again? And what yep. happens to pharmacy education in, in, yep. in that, that context? Um, so online education and pharmacy outcomes, um, mm -hmm. are we going to achieve the same outcomes in pharmacy education 
doing everything online compared to face to face? Uh, the first question I'd ask you is how confident are you we have actually achieved the outcomes in face-to-face -face education Ooh, that, okay. we, uh, <laughs> that we that uh, we like to think that we have achieved um, no, so it's, a, it's actually a very very good question mm. uh, and partly part of the issue is outcomes in a professional program like pharmacy are contingent on a real world practice and right now we don't even know what that real world practice looks like mm -hmm. and so to suggest we have to meet certain kinds of outcomes is challenging one of the big problems i see in higher education is that higher education is an incredibly bureaucratized affair mm -hmm. there are layers and layers of governance there are layers and layers of accreditation there are layers and layers of quality assurance all of which have evolved for good reason yep. to ensure the quality and integrity of educational programs and to ensure competence and readiness to practice for graduates. But that bureaucracy that has been there has a safeguard to ensure quality now potentially is actually an impediment at a time where we need rapid evolution. Mm -hmm. How rapidly can higher education actually evolve in the current times that we are seeing. Yeah. The other issue that uh, is sort of connected to this is something that a lot of uh, social scientists describe as the democratization of knowledge. Mm. That the unique knowledge base and to a certain extent skill set upon which a profession like pharmacy is based, but not only pharmacy, yeah. is now so widely accessible. Do you actually need professionals to do that work. Mm. Let me give you an example. There's some really interesting developments occurring in uh, several other health professions that I think pharmacists should really focus on. The professions I'm thinking of are optometry and dentistry. Optometry is a profession that is potentially really ripe for enormous dislocation. Mm. Um, around the world, there are a variety of online retailers of glasses and what opticians and optometrists do yep. um, for the part what the, the main way their bread is buttered is through the assessment of vision and the prescription of in routine cases corrective eyewear yep. particularly for opticians the people that make glasses and the people that sell them but also for optometrists who depend very heavily on the sale of glasses in many cases yep. as a way of maintaining financial viability of an opticianary practice, optometric practice, things have changed very rapidly. Glasses which used to cost in the order of four or $500, if not more, can be had online for 20 or $30. Yep. This is the most important skill that opticians perhaps possessed, or the most unique skill was measuring of something called focal distance. Focal distance between pupils, which allows you to figure out where you place lenses and concentration for Got the it. construction of lenses. There's actually handy dandy self-assessment instruments that, that are good enough. Wow. Dentists, um, there's a lot of online ways that you can buy braces and corrective orthodontic appliances. Mm -hmm. They may not be as high quality, as good, as effective as the ones that are produced bespoke for individuals by highly trained uh, den dental professionals, yeah. but they're much cheaper and for many people good enough is good enough. Yeah. Many professions have been built upon business models where the provision of a commodity at an inflated price, glasses, braces, cross subsidizes <laughs> the cost of the profession yep. and the more challenging clinical situations. That equation is breaking down very quickly across professions like dentistry yep. and opticianry and across pharmacy. That, that that makes sense, but and and COVID nineteen is is just accelerating that that kind of that fragmentation that's taking place around each of the the commoditized uh, components in uh, in pharmacy. Um, you, you know, coming back to to pharmacy education outcomes and thinking about in the the future, um, what that 
would would it be fair to say that a pharmacy school as we know it today would be significantly reduced um, mm-hmm. in the number of uh, lecture theatres that it has, the the number of the the office space that it has for for staff, um, yep. the number of students on campus. Yep. I th- a large part of that depends on what it is that you mean by a pharmacy school, because around the world there are so many different versions of this breed. Yeah, bear no similarity to one another. My university, uh, University of Toronto, we pride ourselves on being a very large research intensive enterprise where we not only educate pharmacists of the future, we have a large and prolific graduate education and research uh, infrastructure. There are components of that that are completely disconnected from the training of the next generation of pharmacists and there are components that connect to it. Yet all of these are put together within a single bucket. Within that bucket that we call our pharmacy school, there are also significant activities related to political advocacy, professional advocacy, um, service to the community. Pharmacy schools vary so widely already in what they do. Mm. Some of them are going to have a difficult time adapting to the current reality. Others of them already have the seed or the kernel of what they need for rapid uh, evolution contained within their staff complement and their spaces already. One of the things that I think is fairly clear regardless of the phenotype of pharmacy school we're talking about, (laughs) I think it's going to be a long time and not just months, probably years Mm -hmm. before we will be able to ask hundreds of students to sit beside each other in a lecture theater. It might be even longer before students themselves are going to be comfortable sitting beside one another in a lecture theater. And so the idea of mass, live, residentially oriented education, not just in pharmacy, but in higher education, Mm. that is going to so quickly evolve. And fortunately, we have a lot of great technology now to allow for that rapid evolution. Yeah, yeah, that's a significant risk. Um, to reopen a higher education institution and uh, and require that students be physically present in the in the same lecture theater it's 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 very much a risk management thing it's kind of yep. you know passing the risk on to the the community yep. to determine if they come on board or not yep it, it, there's also beyond like the immediate risk of that activity the part of the problem is for the foreseeable future and this we're talking not just one year maybe 3 5 7 years given what we've all gone through right now yeah. Many of us are going to have a hard time long-term planning around this. Mm. We're always going to be looking over our shoulder and wondering, what's the next time? <laughs> we've demonstrated that we've actually been able to go into lockdown relatively seamlessly in higher education. Yeah. Well, if we're always wondering if that's going to happen again, why bother starting? Why not just from a risk mitigation and a, a, a stress reduction perspective, just do it like this always and this could become very quickly I think a new normal in higher education in general particularly for courses and programs where there is not a strong need for some kind of direct observation of students where pharmacy has some problems that we need to and I'm sure we will figure out is what do we do about laboratory based activities what do we do about for example courses in physical assessment Mm. Um, what do we do about compounding kinds of courses, pharmaceutics courses. I'm sure in very short order, we're going to see very sophisticated online versions of these um, come to come to market and be commercialized and very quickly substitute for some of the hands-on bench-based yeah. types of uh, lab activities that perhaps you're more familiar with from your Um, sorry, uh, Zubin. Um, the well, um, so you know, taking the the pharmacy curriculum, and and, and this will be the the second last question be, before we wrap up. Is some parts of the pharmacy curriculum is really easy to to put online and mm-hmm. to, to kind of accelerate and provide. It. And I uh, I guess in the the future there may be one single nationally standardized online curriculum for pharmacy that are that is then in um, in a way. Uh, disseminated through each of the the schools of pharmacy but but then the, this other idea that maybe 
you know, putting a laboratory in a box and shipping it out to the to the pharmacy students in order to do their lab work at home, kind of mm -hmm. you know, lab in a box at home <laughs> type mm -hmm. of type of idea. It's a, it's a crazy thought, but uh, it just definitely requires a significant amount of, of adjustment to to be able to to do that. Um, the the last question before we wrap up: uh, pharmacy careers around. Um, you know, you're an academician. You've um, been at the University of Toronto for a very long time. Is this going to reshape how academic pharmacy career is is seen for potential graduates coming in? Uh, yes, I do. I do. I, I personally have great concerns about that. The sort of for for younger colleagues or people who are considering or just starting out on an academic trajectory. We don't really know what the implications of this are all going to be. Yeah. First of all, it appears fairly clear to me, and I come from a country in a context that has strong, well, relatively well-funded public education. How much money will governments have to support higher education when so much is going to have to be dedicated to healthcare going forward? Absolutely. And so funding models for higher education, including for the kind of research that goes on in higher education, that's going to be a very significant uh, question going forward. As seems apparent, if we're moving to a model of online education, we might not need as many people mm. to train the next generation if we're looking at massive open online courses. We certainly cannot expect students to pay the relatively high amounts of tuition they pay in certain countries yeah. for their pharmacy programs, which typically use, are used to cross-subsidize other activities within a school of pharmacy. So the whole financial model is shifting. Some countries, and here I'm particularly thinking of the United Kingdom and Australia, yep. have become extraordinarily dependent on international students and the tuition that they bring to higher education. We don't know what's going to happen with that kind of academic migration that supported domestic activities. And globalization of education has been a big uh, big way for many post-secondary institutions to be able to sustain themselves. That's going to change very, very rapidly. All of this by way of saying that, similar to community pharmacy, yeah. there are enormous opportunities and enormous threats. An individual embarking on an academic career today who had a view of a very comfortable, cozy life of writing grants, writing papers, teaching a few classes, not being troubled by the realities yep. of the world, that is not going to be what higher education looks like, certainly not in the next five to ten years. Got it, got it. Well, uh, that's a, a good place to, to wrap up, uh, Professor Austin. Um, thanks so much for, for sharing your, your views and your insights. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And um, uh, thanks so much, uh, everyone, for connecting. Uh, if you'd like to be notified of uh, future webinars, uh, please be sure to drop us an email uh, or give us a call. We'd be happy to connect uh, Professor Austin. Once again, thanks so much for your time. Thank you.